Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas for living in this world. Coming to you from 43 degrees south on a small farm in deepest Tasmania. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, we welcome to the show Michael Schellenberger. Michael is a Time magazine hero of the environment, a Green Book Award winner, and one of the world's leading intellectuals in the field of clean energy. He has been an environmental activist since his teen years, founding Amnesty Chapters while still in school, traveling to Nicaragua in the 80s to help the Sandinistas, and he even ran for governor of California in 2018. Michael is also the president and founder of Environmental Progress. He joins us today to talk about his latest book, Apocalypse Never, Why Environmental Alarmism Hurts Us All. Michael, thank you very much for your time. Hey, thanks for having me. Nice one, nice one. Well, congratulations on the book. Uh, I guess like the first question would be, um, why did you write it and, and what's it about? <laughs> Well, I had a lot of motivations, actually, um, many, many motivations. The book is really about three different things. It's about, it's sort of the first parts of debunking of common environmental myths, while also explaining the things that we should be concerned about when it comes to the environment. The second third of the book is about how humans actually save the natural environment. How do we save the whales? How do we protect more natural environment? And then the third part of the book, is addressing this issue of why, if environmental problems are real, and in many cases serious, but not the end of the world, did we come to see them as the apocalypse? And I wrote the book, I dedicated the book to my children who are ages 14 and 21. I wanted it to be, I tried to write it as um, exciting as I could with a lot of characters and adventures and stories so that, it, that kids would read it. Um, you know, I kind of joke that it's an environmental studies textbook wrapped in a, an adventure story. So I'm hoping people will read it, kids read it for that reason. I mean, we know that people are buying it, but so first and foremost for my kids, I think that the, the environmental rhetoric got too extreme. It really scared a lot of people. It may be contributing to anxiety and depression. And then I think the other big motivation is that it just really bothers me how environmentalists have, are basically doing things that make the situation worse for people in poor countries as well as for the natural environment. So I, um, you know, I wrote this book as, as an activist, as somebody that cares about environment to basically say, you know, everything they told us about the environment is wrong and we need to, um, we need to just focus on a whole set of different things. Yeah, I think the, um, the, the part, I mean, I love this kind of stuff and the, and the part that I certainly resonated with is the, um, the rallying against despair, right? So um, there's, there seems to be something about um, climate alarm. It's, I don't know if, how familiar you are with Dr. Donna Haraway, but she says words like the Anthropocene threaten to become too big. And, and they sort of, they, they suck any of the, um, the hope or the, or the will to actually affect change out of uh, movements that sort of require it. And, and it seems that, uh, that's certainly been the story, uh, a kind of like a growing story over a decade about something like climate alarmism, hasn't it? Yeah, I didn't know Donna Haraway said that. I respect her work a lot. She's actually writes on primates famously, which is a big, big subplot in my book. I totally agree with her. In fact, I regret having kind of participated in some of that Anthropocene debate. I totally agree, right? If you want to solve problems, you break them into smaller pieces. That's just how we solve problems. So, the, so when, we, when you see people going and making environmental problems larger than they are, insisting that they all have to be solved at the same time or there's some necessary connection, that's when you start to wonder, is, what's really going on here? Is this really about solving environmental problems or is it about advancing some more radical, you know, oh, sweeping agenda. And obviously that's, you know, what I end up concluding. 
so yeah, and I, and I think that the depression, I mean, one of the questions I've been wrestling with for many years is, came out of basically reading both books about the civil rights movement, which after I would finish reading them, I would feel inspired and happy and energized. And then I would read books about, you know, by Bill McKibben and other environmentalists about climate change and their environmental issues, and I would feel depressed. And I remember thinking, you know, and I've, one of the questions I've had is, you know, does envir is environmentalism, does it attract depressed people or does it make people depressed? Yeah, I like um, it. I knew I wanted to write a book that did the opposite. Yeah, and and I I guess we should start with a or give people a little bit of a backstory here. I, I heard on a on a another show you did recently around the launch of the book, and I thought this was an excellent point, and it's one I've struggled with, but you articulated it really really well, which is. Um, the opposite of climate alarmism isn't climate denial and, and kind of like people on the right, yeah, yeah. The, if you're having this sort of the panicked um, extreme that, that gives people um, depression and, and messes with children's mental health on one side, the opposite of that isn't to say that it was invented by the Chinese to keep American business down or something, right? Like it's, um, and I think, and I think you, you articulate it really well, which is that sort of people on the, I guess, moderate right, missed a trick like you shouldn't in the, the conversation the opposite of of alarmism isn't it's it's almost like climate sobriety i suppose rather than denial <laughs> that's pretty good i haven't heard that one before i like climate sobriety yeah for sure i mean look you know i had i wrote this book for so many different people i mean i had so many different people on my mind but certainly you know i wanted to write it for people that are, i think are progressives and liberals and democrats you know like myself i guess at this point i would say i'm a moderate democrat but i also wanted to write it for conservatives i have a lot of conservative friends i really there's a lot about conservatism i respect i don't always agree with all of it but yeah for sure i mean um i wanted to write something that that said look it's not climate change is not the end of the world you know, it's not our most serious environmental problem, but we should still do something about it. And it's not being caused by sunspots or <laughs> natural cyclical variations like carbon is a heat trapping molecule and most of what the IPCC says, in my view, when it comes to the actual science of climate change is, is right on. I mean, when they get to kind of what they recommend, it's pretty terrible, but, but certainly for most of the science, I wanted to kind of, certainly help conservatives move towards a more moderate and science-based position. Yeah, I think you succeeded, Michael. Uh, the book manages to thread that needle, right? Because there are other ones and some that are coming out, I'm not going to mention names that kind of even in the subtitle make it pretty clear who, which, which side of the aisle they want to read the book, right? And, and I don't know, having read some of them and, and whatever, I don't know how much that is going to contribute <laughs> to an improvement. I, I think it just, it, it's going to land with people who already are in the, in like a denial camp. And then it just, it polarizes the discussion and we're sort of stuck going round and round again. And that's one of the things I really appreciated about your book was that it was, I mean, we were recording by a, we well, briefly chatted by a video before we hit the record button. I'm happy to confirm you're not wearing a MAGA hat. Um, and I think that, you know, <laughs> I think these are discussions that are um, urgent for people who are in, in, in an activist and, and sort of pro environmentalist um, mode, right? And that's something that comes across in the book. You have, you have a long history in this, starting with a teenage birthday party from memory. Yeah, I mean, I've been an environmental activist all my life. I still identify as an environmental activist. Um, I'm very proud of the book. I, I think it's a serious book. I think it's a scholarly book. It's certainly not a polemic. I've written polemics. So I don't have anything against polemics, but that's not what I wanted to do here. Even so, it's not like I'm not writing this book because like, I just wanted to educate people or I just thought it was a, a neat story. I, I'm trying to draw attention to some things that I think are really unfair and bad and that we should get our heads screwed on right. Um, you know, particularly around this issue of access to cheap energy for poor countries, you know, access to modern agriculture for poor countries. I've, I've been upset at the ways in which, you know, rich countries have basically denied poor countries you know, access to the basic foundations of development. So, you know, but hopefully this will come and arrive at some more moderate place. I mean, the subtitle is Why Environmental Alarmism Hurts Us All. 
which is, you know, a more liberal framing. I mean, one of the, um, or maybe it mixes conservative and liberal. You know, one of the people that blurbed the book is a guy named Jonathan Haidt, who's a famous psychologist who looks at the moral foundations of different ideologies, including conservatism and liberalism. And he always points out, you know, liberals are more oriented towards care and harm. Um, but, you know, both conservatives and liberals are oriented towards towards fairness and justice, which is something that really runs through the text is my my concern that really we've, we've forgotten the world's poorest people. And in, in some cases, we've been using climate change or environmentalists have been using climate change to to really restrict growth, you know, for poor countries. And that's not right. And, and we needed to, to take a look a harder look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you suppose it's been about, it's sort of grown over five decades, right? Like it's, it's been my experience having, you know, done um, Green Party work and um, various, whatever country I'm in, um, environmental stuff. Why do you suppose climate alarmism, when I started, and I know it's the same for you, um, environmentalism didn't mean one thing it meant very often like tactical local achievable things to do with protection of habitat or or whatever um and over the last few decades why is it that climate alarmism has grown to not just dwarf but consume all other almost like environmentalist trajectories right why why is why do you think that happened a really great question. Certainly one of the questions in the book, last third of the book is sort of why did we, what, what are the underlying motivations of apocalyptic environmentalism? And I look at money, power, and religion. There's obviously some financial interests. I mean, a big financial interest. So the renewables industry is maybe the biggest. The second is sort of power. This is sort of the Malthusian, you know, too many people, too much consumption. We can't let poor countries grow. It's a lifeboat. We're all going to die, that kind of stuff. But then the third chapter, you know, is the last chapter in the book. Um, maybe the chapter I'm most proud of. I think it's the book. I think it's the chapter that kind of represents the culmination of the of all the book and and the deeper psychological and existential questions I'm raising. And I say, you know, this is environmentalism is the dominant secular religion of the elite. You know, of educated of educated people in Europe, the United States, you know, even Korea, you know, Japan. Um, and that basically, I, that I summarize a bunch of scholarship. This is, you know, I'm, I'm actually very proud of the fact that the book contains very few original, very little original research. I'm always trying to rely on other people so that I can't get, you know, so that I can defend the text as very mainstream in some ways. But, you know, there's all this evidence that basically the people that are the most apocalyptic about climate change are experiencing, they often have a lot of social anxiety. They're, they're often, they're, they're feeling powerless. They want power in society or in their families or in their schools in the case of kids. And so they engage in this apocalyptic story, which puts themselves at the center of this very dramatic, you know, story of saving the planet, you know, saving all of its species. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with wanting to live a heroic life. In fact, I think it's a, I think it's really admirable. The problem comes when you're completely unaware of it and you're so in the grip of it. So, you know, normally if you're Jewish or Christian or Muslim or whatever, and you identify as that, I'm Jewish or Christian, and, you know, and then you have science. But in the case of environmentalists, they think that they are being more true to the science. They think, the apocalyptic environmentalists think that they're more in touch with some end of the world than other people. They always give reasons why they think people are in, they say denial or, you know, and so you get this, it's just become increasingly extreme. I don't, I think there's concern for nature in there, but I think it has also, I trace this roots back to fear of nuclear war, you know, the end of the cold war, um, you know, and really the rising secularization where people need something to believe in and environmentalism offers this just incredibly powerful, heroic myth that people can cast themselves into as heroes. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, we've done some, unsurprisingly, we've done some work with, with other guests um, this year on apocalypses as ersatz re-enchantments um, because they, they, they sort of re-haunt the world and, and, and fill it with meaning, but it's, um, if you don't acknowledge where it's coming from, which is the a, a psychological 
um, if not reaction and psychological pull, but it's, it, it exists in that kind of interface between mind and reality. And you can find that other ways without sort of isolating yourselves from your friends and family by telling them that their children are going to die in 10 years time. Like they're, they're, that's not a good version of it. So do you think it's primarily psychological? Because the other half of the book, well, the, the back end of the book it does, I think the best job I've read of kind of explaining how you end up with, um, green tech and other energy companies um, supporting um, activism, which agitates to get taxpayer money spent on the same, those same green companies. And you end up with, um, and I just, my sense, I have a sort of genuine cynicism of, of large companies and, and, and so on. There's at least part of it that um, becomes very, becomes very useful. I, I had a moment a couple of years ago thinking, why has, any kind of local or hyperlocal environmental action been subsumed into a globalized understanding of whatever of climate alarmism so that the most urgent thing we can do is give money to large corporations to put wind farms in another country and it just seems like there's been yeah. a, a i know which is just sort of like the definition of of environmental irresponsibility, right? I mean, gosh. There's no part of that sentence I like, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think I mean, it, it's, yeah, go on. No, you go ahead. I'm, you're in, you're, I'm interested. Go ahead. Well, I think if you explain it to people like that, it, it's funny, you get snatches, it, you, you do see an almost like a, um, a, a Jungian style possession involved because if you explain it to people like that, it's like, okay, so if I follow your logic, what you want is my money to go to a large corporation that is already, already getting my tax money to put wind farms in a developing country where it will destroy birds and raise the cost of energy for the poorest 5 billion on earth by a thousand percent. <laughs> Like, yeah, but other than that, yeah, like, uh, but other than great. those yeah, things, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, when you really put it all together, it's kind of amazing, right? Because you're kind of like, let me get this straight. Um, this is a group of people who are motivated by a kind of insecurity in their own life, you know, whether it's sort of, you know, uh, the school children who are depressed or anxious they feel guilty because they think that, you know, somehow their lifestyle is destroying the planet or you get middle-aged people. I mean, it's often these two groups, you know, it's teenagers and middle-aged people who are in basically life existential moments, kind of resolving itself manically, turning themselves into moralizers for vegetarianism and not using plastic straws and putting renewables up everywhere. The effect of their actions is to, is to make electricity or energy more scarce and expensive for poor people and to expand the environmental footprint of energy and food production so that more land is required and more wildlife is endangered. And, and really almost nothing is done to mitigate the risk of climate change in the end because they're also taking down nuclear plants. So yeah, you're kind of like, wow. I mean, when I kind of put this book together, I was like, I had I wanted it to be comprehensive because I had a lot to say, I mean, a lot to say, obviously, but it was also kind of like when you put it together, it's kind of shocking that this thing, now, of course, you know, what is the thing that travels under the sign of being, you know, good for, good for nature and, um, and harmonizing with nature, it's something that, that would actually end up being quite destructive with it. You know, you're right, like a Jungian would start to see that, right, that you'd be like, if you don't know what's motivating somebody, ask, you know, ask yourself, you know, if you don't, you know, what the impact of their actions is, right, is the classic. Well, yeah, Indian exactly. Terrible, I guess, right? Yeah, um, I, and it, I think you're correct. It, it's almost a, a self bill statement to say that it's it's become a really it, it's it's lack of rationality has made it a really and i'm you know i am religious so i i don't mean this in a pejorative of all religions but i mean if you're it was super interesting to see with the rise of extinction rebellion the the use of the science as a noun like we have the science as if it was right. a fetish object right, right. it's like right. saying we have the walking like you're using a verb effectively like it's not correct but it uh, one yes uh, it was an irrational attempt 
um, or it was an irrational belief system that believed it was rational. And I find it really interesting, but I, and, and you kind of use the religious overtones, but it's when you realize the impact of what they're trying to do in saving the world will kill millions of people. It's a death cult. Like it's not even enough to call it a religion at, at this sort of point. And I think that's the, what I loved about the balance in the book is climate alarmism is making the things that people who are alarmed about environmentalism care about worse. <laughs> and that's, it's a really difficult psychological challenge to kind of unpick in people's minds, isn't it? Yeah. And of course, it just, it's what made it so fun to write. And so there's so much tension in the book and conflict and contradiction. And yeah, I mean, I thought it's interesting what you just said about the science. I mean, I think what Extinction Rebellion is actually saying is the truth and of course, the, the truth as a value—the truth as something valuable—if you if you believe Friedrich Nietzsche on this, um, you know, and that before that, like the Christian need to convince everybody that that their God was the true God was sort of an unusual. It was a, something unusual compared to the pagan, I'm sorry, the Judeo-Christian, you know, will to you know to say there's a single God and you have to all know the truth. That was sort of different than the pagan religion before, which was well, we all have our gods and you've got your God and I got my God and they're kind of duking it out in some way or we're working together or whatever. It was a little bit more, um, it was plural. So I see that, you know, you see that monotheism in, in apocalyptic environmentalism. And the most interesting scholarship I found, unfortunately, by a guy who sadly died way too young, a very good scholar at George Mason University. He was actually an EPA administrator and he did this big study basically comparing, and you'll love this part too, environmentalism as a religion to basically neoclassical economics as a religion. Mm. Um, and, but what he was, what was so interesting about it was just the, you know, that he's like, he's like, yeah, I mean, if it seems like they're just repeating, if apocalyptic environmentalists are just repeating Judeo-Christian mythology and don't know it, that's because they never really learned it in a conscious way. So they ended up just kind of absorbing it unconsciously through the culture, through Hollywood, through all the rest. Yeah, our, our culture has like a, a biblical shape and whether or not you went to Sunday school or, or what have you, if you're kind of unaware of that, it's, it's, in, our, it's in our phraseology, in our slang, it's in our Shakespeare, it's wherever. So um, it, you end up accidentally almost yeah, living out a biblical narrative if you, uh, accidentally, if you don't intend to do it like intentionally, right? And um, that was, it was really fun. So the two things that I, I took away most importantly from a, I guess, optimism perspective, the book, I mean, you've, you know, um, you've tested, I think, was it this year that you spoke before Congress? Was that January? It was, it was. Yeah, so like the book, it's, it's interesting. I'm always looking for what the, I guess, actionable um, outcomes of, of a book might be. And yours is very much in the kind of like policy space. It's like, I'm, this is something that I am, that this is part of my journey to get the entire world to think urgently and differently about how we generate energy, right? But there's a couple of them that I thought there's, there's a tremendous amount of individualized value as a person listening to the show who's like, okay, I'm going to read the book. What, what do I do once I finish the book? And they're, they're kind of like the, the main one in the climate alarmism thing is like, yeah, climate change is real. Your kids aren't going to die in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> of of whatever that is, the, to actually unpick the how and when of that cover story. So there's a tremendous um, relief is the is the, uh, one of the right words I suppose you could use. But the other one is I was so excited I was punching air at a few points because this has been a rant that I've I've been going on for years that our at a, an un, an environmentalist understanding of the environment is essentially wholly neoplatonic. Um, so it's another area that's yeah. kind of like. Yeah, it's it's a cosmology that's that thinks it's scientific when it is, at best, philosophical, uh, and and these these ideas that underpin environmentalism kind of emerge from that nineteenth century. Uh, almost like an imperial project, like you need a tabula rasa, pristine nature, and that's just not how the force works, is it? No. Yeah, you're so exactly right. I mean, you and. Um, Exactly. So it's, you know, it's everything's in its right place. Nature is this bounded whole. I mean, I've been thinking of, I don't know if you have it in Australia, but it's the, the Jenga puzzle. Do you know the Jenga puzzle? Sure. 
Yeah, so it's the Jenga puzzle where, you know, if you pull one piece out, the whole thing collapses. Um, you're not quite sure which one it is. And I point out that, you know, it's ridiculous. I mean, if we want to save, as I do, mountain gorillas, yellow-eyed penguins, blue fairy penguins, you know, and all these amazing species, whales, great blue whales and, and humpbacks, like, um, we should want to save them for their sake. We don't, and because we like them, it shouldn't be the story that is told so often is terrible, which is that if those species go extinct, then our civilization will somehow collapse. Like nobody, yeah. it's so kind of, it's a kind of amazing how the stories actually get repeated because there's just literally no mechanism for it. You know, it's like the gorillas went extinct in Africa and then what, like the electrical grid in the United States stopped working for some reason. I mean, it's just really bizarre. Um, but it's well, rife it's, with that. It is, especially at the moment because the loudest voices are there agitating for, um, you know, your taxpayer money <laughs> to go to, to these ludicrous devices. And, uh it, I had Charles Eisenstein on the show and his book uh, on climate was um, really, really useful for me. And one of the things that he points out when it comes to, we, and you just said it, we should save these animals or perpetuate their flourishing for its own sake. To do so otherwise is quite utilitarian, but it's almost right. like we're saving resources for us. So it's, it's still making humans separate from nature, which is an impossibility. And also that they're, they're kind of like food we have in the cupboard like oh these are this is an important resource for us or where we need to protect these yeah. resources they're not resources yeah. they're whales they, they're gorillas yes they're <laughs> yes you said it well in the process of art, creating artificial substitutes is the process of allowing whales and gorillas to become ends of themselves and not means to ends it's precisely the liberation uh, um, from our needs that those species can have you know, can be valued in and of themselves, almost in a Kantian way, right? So, yeah, I mean, um, I think it's a beautiful story, actually, right? That, like, we got yeah. so rich and powerful that we can save whales and gorillas. Like, that's, why is that not heroic? Seems pretty darn heroic to me, especially when you consider how much humans have suffered up until now. I mean, obviously, they're, su they're suffering now. We talk a lot about it, but still, when you kind of go you know, we're down to basically 2 billion people that are still stuck using wood as fuel and having to not eat the meat that they would like to eat. Or when they do often it's wild meat, which is obviously wild animals that we want, that most of us want to see kept, you know, allowed to be in nature in a certain way. So, you know, there's this huge progress has been made and what a disrespect to it and to sort of yeah. be like, we want to go back to what it was like in Elizabethan England or something. <laughs> it always seems to be Elizabeth in England, you know? Yeah, something like Renaissance that. fairs and yeah, it, it um, uh, and and there's all these good news stories that are hidden underneath it, which again, uh, with a permi background, I was aware of, but I'm I'm glad that you sent it. Like, uh, I mean, it'll turn it into a question: um, Are we using more or less land for agriculture at the moment? What what is that graph trending up or down? Well, so land total land use appears to be going down. The data has been a little. Um, noisy i guess you would say in the sense of the reporting is just really hard on land use everywhere but you know people do it scientists definitely are trying to tabulate it and the one thing that we do know is going down and that peaked in 2000 was land used for meat production and since that's you know humans use about half the ice free surface of the earth and most of that is for food production only about three percent is for cities and built environment and, and energy is only half a percent. So most of that's for food and, and some wood production for buildings and, and other materials. But, you know, 25% of the ice-free surface of the earth, half of our impact is just meat production. So the fact that meat production peaking is going down is just a huge, massive story. I mean, and it really, it's sort of sad that, like, my daughter, who's, not, who's 14, and her friends who look up to Greta Thunberg, they would never learn that from Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg would never tell them that, that the amount of land that humans are using for meat is going down, and that's incredibly good news, or that carbon emissions peaked in most rich countries. In some rich countries, they peaked in the mid-70s, you know? So, and it, so, so, yeah, for sure. I wanted to push back a bit. So, it's part because, you know, you get, there's just some stuff, especially where you're like, you don't need to worry about some of these things. Now, there are some problems that we're not worried about enough, you know, and that we don't ever talk about, like you were saying at the beginning of the call, I've sort of been 
or at the beginning of our podcast, which is sort of being forgotten. So the hope here is that, you know, you actually get a kind of reassessment of what matters when it comes to, to if you really are caring about protecting the natural environment. Well, it, it empowers you to realize that this, because again, the, the sort of monolith of alarmism means you, you end up in a, what's the point? Why would I bother um, building, how we're doing, we're doing native grass tussocks on the hill by the river here. We live in a little farm mm. for the fairy wren, um, because that's habitat that it uses. And, and if I was faced with a kind of um, Thunberg apocalypse, I'd be like, well, what's the point? Well, there is a point. Yeah. There is a point in, in making sure that you have, uh, you know, a regenerative um, food supply as best as possible in the area you're in. There is the, the, the things you can do. It's sort of a, a returning. I found this really encouraging to the kind of early days of, of uh, environmental responsiveness or activism that like, no, they matter. There's things that you can, you can relax about this stuff and you can, <laughs> And you can be inspired or empowered to do things that you can actually affect change with. I think that's remarkable. Yeah, it's exciting, um, for sure. Um, all the rewilding work, the return of marginal agricultural lands, you know, that's why, you know, it's sort of harsh, but it's like these, when everyone's like, the family farmer and the farms, they don't need the farms anymore. And you're kind of like, well, that'll be more, that'll be like some more grassland, restore some rivers, you know, if you don't, at least if we don't pave them with solar panels or chop up, you know, birds with wind turbines, you know, it's exciting to be able to rewild these areas. It's totally inspiring. And of course, yeah, one's connection to one's local environment. I mean, that's how, that's how, that's how, that's how areas are protected, right? They're protected by people that live there for the most part with some, you know, very famous exceptions like redwood trees or the great coral reefs, I guess. But for the most part, local environments are protected locally. Yeah, um, I want to, we, we want to talk, so that's the kind of like individualized stuff, but I want to talk about, oh no, there's another bit of good news and then we'll sort of move into the policy bits, right? But here's the other thing that I think people are terrified of and uh, and it's the sort of sixth mass extinction. So where did this idea come from and is this something else that we can be differently concerned about? So this is kind of outrageous. So we're, humans are not affecting a mass extinction. We're not on track to affect a mass extinction. Like I just, like we just said, when you say, when you realize that the amount of land we're using for, for meat production is going down and it appears that overall land used for food production is going down, that means that there's going to be more room for habitat. So there's actually not a scenario where, where we affect these extinctions, but the, the particular science which dates back to the late 60s, is just a model where assumptions were made about how quickly species would go extinct as their habitat was reduced in size. And, you know, there's just one famous nature study that just completely eviscerates these, <laughs> these, these extinction prediction studies. And the first sentence is something like, the species area model always overestimates extinctions now, the sad part of it is just that, you know, we have lost important habitat. So many species have seen their numbers decline. We've lost half of all wild animals between 1961 and today. So definitely there was just a huge impact. Now, that doesn't need to, those trends certainly don't need to continue. In fact, they should go the opposite direction as more farmland is reverted, you know, back into potentially naturally, natural areas. But nonetheless, to your point, and this is what the scientists say, and of course it makes complete sense, is that if it's a sixth grade extinction, why bother? If it's just there's no point, yeah. there's some sense in which, and of course this ties back to what we were talking about earlier, the role of religion is providing a, a way to think about the afterlife and one's immortality. You're gonna, you, you know, at the end of your life, you may look back at the restoration that you did and the wren, is that right? Um, yeah that you're restoring that 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 species is gonna is kind of there and is going to live on thanks to your work and to some extent that gives you some kind of immortality and something to feel really proud of it's your legacy and so telling people that they can't that that's not going to exist or they're not going to have it is actually what that actually is is it's the voice of a depressed person a depressed person says there's no point in doing anything it's all futile the world has no meaning um, life has no purpose. I mean, that, that's the voice of a depressed person, but it is often what people, I think, get as the voice of the environmentalists. 
Yeah, exactly. And, and that's uh, when I say new, I'm, I'm sure you'll appreciate what I mean by this. It's new in the last 30 decades, because 30 decades, 30 years, because we used to be about that. Right? We used to know that, it, in fact, if you protect or, or, or uh, build specific habitat, it really works. <laughs> it works of really course. well and quickly. You know, this is a thing we should be um, urgently. And it, again, it's another thing that you can be empowered on an individual basis. I've got five acres, so I can do it literally on my land, but that doesn't need to be the case. You will, wherever you live, you're going to have an area that's like, actually, I think we can build habitat or ensure its continuity. And, and it works. It's not like, um, right. it's the right. opposite. It works every, every time you see someone do that, like, wow, that worked really quickly. Or those fish came really quickly. That was, um, this is a good news story. And we, we actually, we do have loads of them. And, and, and that's something that I think, you know, it's in there. This is, this, there's a good news story. I, I got on the, I got, I guess, extinction red pilled on my Permi journey because we were looking at what percentage of, and this is actually kind of true speaking of farmland. Like if you have about 30% of farmland um, or area, particularly of its edge effect being kind of like wildlife allocated and you're not using chemicals, um, the, the sort of total biodiversity and biomass doesn't move that much. So there's some interesting numbers around it. The industrial farming can't really do that, but it's obviously small and medium scale farms can. And I remember looking at trying to find the list of the species that went extinct when there's an article about like, uh, 100,000 species went extinct this year. And I'm like, where's the list? And there isn't a list. And if you follow, like, well, what species went extinct? And then it all comes out of these kind of computer game versions of the earth. Same thing with climate models, not actually reality. And if you press them on it, they're like, oh, it must be microscopic life that went extinct. But you could flip that around and say, well, maybe new species were created because that's a highly dynamic kind of like, group that we, we maybe we have uh -huh. billions of bacteria right right well for sure i mean there's certainly in the you know the famous studies you know from um you know britain are also that you know the biodiversity increases with invasive species so you kind of yeah. can't have it both ways <laughs> you can't you can't complain about lack of biodiversity and complain about foreign invaders because <laughs> that's how you get it's, it yeah but that's the 19th century imperial model that comes back to nature as this um, pristine and delicate woman in need of our protection, because it, it's that same um, 19th century imperial impulse, right? Like uh, you, you, foreigners are bad. Uh, and I mean, that was at the beginning of environmentalism. I'm sure you're aware um, the World Wildlife Founder was eugenicist. Like the, these guys literally came from that biological thinking. And it's one of the other kind of like mental ghosts that infect environmentalist heads and they don't realize it. it's like, well, are you, are you, um, are you a eugenicist? And I well, no. And I'm like, then what, what is your, <laughs> what is your thinking on these so-called invasives rather than why don't we call them novel? Um, you know, why are they, why are they invasive or foreign? And I, I have, yeah, the numbers on that, I've given talks on it. Like the U S is the best case, right? You have an, you have an estimated 5,000 novel species and that's 5,000 more. So if you look at the number of species that have certainly gone extinct, net biodiversity in like the continental U S is up. It's 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 up dramatically, and and that's good. Like, isn't biodiversity good? It gets to a point where there's not it's not sort of this kind of rules that should be set at anything other than local levels. I mean, our our neighbors just took down this huge eucalyptus tree that was habitat for red-tailed hawks and red-shouldered hawks and some buzzards and incredible. And it was like you know, it would hunt the rodents and it was just you know perfect habitat for them. But on the other hand, you know, it's we we have these beautiful native oaks. This you know, this eucalyptus. It's not a great tree. What's the right answer there? Well, that's not. I mean, it's how the neighbors fought it out. I mean, that's how in reality they decided. But there's not like you would you wouldn't kind of no one would roll into Berkeley from out or to this neighborhood in Berkeley, California, and be like the right tree to have there is determined by some. It's like it's just whether or not you wanted the eucalyptus tree or not. Right, it's not just decided by whether how recently it arrived. Yeah, and that's the bit. And also, given um, because again, climate change is real. None of, it, none of us are wearing MAGA hats here. Like, um, 
30% of the species that um, were first described since Europeans started describing them have moved as a result of like different temperatures and, and environment change, like around the planet, like, you know, trees are marching like ants, right? And um, it seems scientifically pointless that it is somehow important that the location of where a species is when it was first described by a European is somehow some sacrosanct fixed thing. Like species, all kinds of things are in flow. Like it's, it's their planet as well, right? And, and it, it just seems really odd that we have, without realizing it, these sort of very dangerous and, and dangerous in their implications, ideas of who is allowed where on, and what kind of thing is allowed. It's, it's creepy when you sort of pull on it, isn't it? Well, for sure. I mean, you know, in the book, we, I, I tell the story of Virunga National Park, which is just one of the most spectacular, you know, Europe, Europe created parks in Central Africa. It's where the mountain gorillas are. And it's just surrounded by some of the poorest people in the world. They've had two horrible civil wars that flew out of the Rwandan genocide. You know, at least three million people killed. I mean, it was terrible. And the park director, who has just received, you know, I mean, it was just glowing media attention in the West. Well, I uncovered in my research that he kind of forced the locals off of park land, which, you know, was sort of in his legal right, but at gunpoint. And these are just, again, people that are like on the brink of starving. I interviewed <clears throat> many people in those communities. And then 250 elephants ended up getting killed. And, and, and so if you lose the locals, you know, if you're imposing a particular reality on people and they're not able to meet their basic needs, it's just not going to work. Um, so yes, exactly what you said. You know, it's tricky because obviously there's some amount of risk that, you know, higher temperatures are going to move habitats into places where there isn't habitat left. On the other hand, you know, these things, it's not happening overnight and the number of protected areas has gone up and then the big factors of more room potentially for nature um, has also been created. So. But yeah, I definitely think that the older model of kind of we're going to come in as, I mean, the kind of the classic is we're going to just, the UN will, everyone will go together at the UN and they're going to put, you know, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of biologists from Harvard and Stanford in charge of the global energy and food economy. It's like not, not, right. not likely to happen. Um, yeah. and, and really when the stuff that they end up getting ends up being pretty terrible. Exactly. Um, let's do the, the final bit, because this is, I think, where um, your uh, professional life is, is taking you now. And I can see it's certainly the core of the book uh, is, is about energy and energy futures. But I want to I segue there. Uh, tell us a story about the, the German wind farms and the insects, because I have this on audiobook as well as Kindle, and I almost had to pull over in horror. Um, I, did not, I had not heard that one before. I thought I'd heard all of them. But tell us that. Well, I mean, it's this amazing study. So this German is like one of the, it's considered one of the best kind of technical policy research institutes in Germany. And it just kind of fits your stereotype of Germany, you know, like the research institute and the quality of this report, which I read very like German precision in describing the impact on migratory insects or, you know, really, all insects, but migratory insects, because of putting these huge wind turbines, these spinning blades into the airshed of these insects. And I went into great detail about the, about the evidence for this. You know, there have long been reports they would pull down the wind turbine blades and have to clean them because they would get so caked in, in bug, you know, bo matter that they wouldn't operate with the same efficiency. So we knew that they were having these big impacts. So he calculates this just outrageously. It was just incredible. It was something like, I think it was like a third, like a, like a third of total insect, uh, migratory insect, by, you know, uh, traveling through getting killed by these wind turbines. He got a little bit of publicity. I got in touch with them and they wouldn't let me talk to him. And the sense I had, and I interviewed some other scientists, was just that this was, um, just not acceptable to the wind industry, which is very powerful in Germany. You know, they make wind turbines there. So, but I, you know, and I, 
I mean, it's one of these things where it's like you look at these environmental impacts of large wind turbines and you're like, how is any of this surprising? Like it all yeah. makes physical sense. You have the bat scientists coming out and just being like, it's just disastrous. The one migratory bat species is expected to go extinct if wind turbines really spread the way they are. So I mean, you just kind of go, oh my goodness. Um, what have we done in the name of harmonizing civilization with nature? We've just ended up destroying it. Yeah, the the insect one, because I don't know why it didn't occur to me. I mean, in, it's sort of like I knew two things and didn't put them together, which is the best place, quote unquote, for um, wind turbines is in essentially like airflows or rivers of wind, like an area where there is a reliable flow of wind so that they turn for as, as often as possible, right? Exactly. And that's obviously, those are the, the sort of sky rivers that insects travel on. Of course they do, because they're very, very small. And it just never occurred to me. So Germany is like, no, it's a weird way, I don't mean, sorry, Germany. Um, but these, these turbines in Germany are right in the river that these things swim through. And those insects don't, that's not a local, it's sort of like you can, however tragic it is, killing large birds, um, the, the sort of hero species with um, wind turbines is one thing. It's another thing to genocide essentially the organisms that require Europe's biology to function. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. terrifying. I mean, it's weird. I mean, it's weird because, you know, when we were kids, We'd all talk about it, how you'd all get all the, you drive on the country roads and you get all the bug matter on your windshields. Yep. Well, we don't have, I mean, it just seems like we don't have that anymore in the United States. And I mean, I just wondered if, you know, I put it in there in the book and, you know, I couldn't you know, get to the bottom of it, but I just put it in there without comment because it was kind of like, my hope was just like, I think maybe we ought to look at this <laughs> because <Yeah. laughs> it's like, it seems like it's got a lot of, um, what I think when you know what science might call face validity, you know, you mm. kind of go, yeah, that it seems like if you put a bunch of spinning blades into the air shed that that birds, bats, and and insects use as their habitat. I mean, I was trying. We were trying to. We were thinking about. I was like, can wind be considered habitat? I mean, in the sense it can. It's really with the birds and bats that are chasing the the insects in it. But you're kind of like, I mean. <laughs> What other part of the natural environment would you put these spinning steel blades in and expect it to have no impact, right? It's wild. Yeah, yeah. and that one, because yes, we, we're experiencing what happens when we lose insects from, from biospheres around, especially the, right. the developed world. And you think, God, that, one, that one's gonna stay with me, Michael, let me tell you. Um, well, and and but, I mean, I'm curious to your view, because I mean, there's the, the traditional story is that it's from industrial agriculture, but my understanding, and again, I didn't put it in the book because I, I just I just hadn't tracked it down or gotten to it, but was, you know, is that, well, I'm sure industrial agriculture has had big impacts. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know why they would have increased over the last 30 years or whatever the periods of time we're looking at with the insect population decline. Do you have a view on that? It it will, um, it will find out too late. This is my best guess. We'll find out too late that everything causes everything right so um it will turn out to be um em radiation and it will turn out to be fertilizers and chemicals and and all the rest of it it'll also and one of the things one of the other reasons for doing a because um, having just said that about quote-unquote invasive species we're uh, dedicating a significant amount of land on the farm to local endemics because Insects in particular, whilst birds might eat from the apple trees and previously they ate from local Tasmanian trees, insects really only thrive and grow on, on, on the local endemics. So it's going to be, it's, it's the case that how we live causes everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, I don't, I, and we have this kind of solutionism that we expect it to be one thing and then we can fix it. And that's the, that's the growth of climate alarmism to dwarf everything else. So when it comes to insect populations, I think we need to do as many little things or as many of the things as possible because it, it can't not be a combination of all of them. And if you pick one, you end up being wrong. I mean, it's a kind of, especially when it comes to things like EM, um, that will undoubtedly be a factor. We just haven't looked at it and we don't know what are we going to do, switch them all off? Like we're going to need to work out 
ways of, of moving back into that flourishing mode. And as you say, like we can do it. We've done it with gorillas. We do it with penguins and, and so on. We can return to that original human idea of being a custodian. The Australian Aborigines um, on the East coast of uh, Australia will and used to, but still sometimes do make watering holes just for kangaroos. So they don't drink from them. And it's not to increase their numbers for hunting or any of that kind of stuff. That's how they manage the, the grasslands, right? It was because that way the kangaroos had something to drink. And that's the right attitude, you know? And I think it's going to be that for everything. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, that was the, the terrifying insect killing wind turbines was the segue into um, a leading question, but I think this is going to be useful for people. What is energy density <laughs> and why does it matter? Yeah. So the idea with energy density is that when you go from using wood to coal, you get about twice as much energy in a lump of coal as in a lump of wood. When you go from that same amount to, to petroleum, to natural gas, and eventually to uranium for nuclear, you just get much more energy out of less matter, so to speak, out of less environment. Um, and that's what you should want. It's sort of the main event. Um, there's another concept that's related, which is the power density, which is just the amount of power per amount of land you're using. And so if you wanna reduce humankind's footprint, you wanna move to higher power densities. And that also goes for cities so that they're getting much, you know, this is really the, the emergence of cities, of big cities required fossil fuels and electricity because otherwise you just can't, it's just, um, we sort of saw the limits of renewables when we had horses and, and carriages in the cities and there'd be large amounts of biomass and feces and even dead horses causing disease and really putting limits on what you could, how big the city could be and what it could do. So modern energy, and density have been important for cities. And this is such a simple concept, and yet I find almost nobody knows about it. It also, of course, explains why solar and wind have had such devastating impacts. On average, a solar and wind farm require at least 300, usually closer to 400 times more land than a natural gas plant or a nuclear plant. And so this is not, um, you know, there was a recent documentary by Michael Moore, or that he helped make about the planet of the humans about the impacts of renewables. And he sort of suggested that their environmental impact was due to capitalism or something, when in reality, mm -hmm. it's just the poor energy density of, of sunlight, water, and wind, the renewables fuels compared to fossil fuels or nuclear. Yeah. That was that was an important but very flawed film. I mean, if if your key takeaway, people, it's worth watching for people listening. Um, the key takeaway is that these simply um, renewables simply do not. They are simply not the answer, like, end of. Um, the rest of it, like, therefore Malthusianism and millions of us should die and all the other kind of stuff. You go, mm, right. It ended on a ended on a really dumb note, but the the key point. And, and it's, it's important in, I think, reconfiguring activism away from alarmism is to say, stop, stop this ridiculous process of, of um, taking money from green tech companies to agitate, to get you to agitate governments to allocate tax money to green companies for things that will raise the cost of your energy, which we've experienced. You have the numbers for the US in the book. Um, none of this... That's literally runaway climate change. <laughs> there's no way. Right. There's no way right. that gets better. And the, and the corporations have absolutely no obligation to deliver energy value uh, um, at value to you. They're like what you're being, you're paying for it with your taxes, and you're paying for it with your energy, and you can't do anything about it, right? So, and I think that's that's sort of crucial when it's unpicking climate alarmism. It's like okay, so what would you, it's the other, it's the next, what would you like to do? Would you like to continue if you're worried about habitat and you don't want something like nuclear, would you like to continue leveling mountains right. for coal? Which, which thing is it? Right. And I think your book is, um, goodness, you must have this conversation so many times, but I, I think it's the most patient hand holding from the beginning of a book the kind of people who are going to read it are like nuclear i do not think so sir and then by the end of it going yeah all right we'll, we'll see what we'll see what michael's on about i hope so i mean i appreciate that that's definitely what i was what i was going for yeah it's um and i mean 
you've converted some high profile uh, <laughs> high profile critics i guess i mean i'm sure i think it was last week so it must have been so zion lights from xr is in the book but she was she was she had she joined you by the time you were writing the book because she's in it and, and now i know she's uh she's joined the movement yeah i mean it's really great <laughs> it's wild yeah so she zion lights is a Extinction Rebellion spokesperson who I interviewed. Um, she was just really eviscerated by Andrew Neal, who's this very famous BBC announcer on television. And I write about that exchange. And then I interviewed her. And that must have been in, I think it was early December, or November, I interviewed her. And, and you know, we were, I think, you know, the call was coming to an end. She goes, hey, you know, you should, I know who you are. And you should know I'm pro-nuclear. I think that I quit the Green Party because of nuclear. I think we need nuclear. And I was like, oh, well, that's cool. And I put that in the very end of the book. It was kind of like just, you know, she really is redeemed by it in some ways. Um, and then we figured out that Britain was really important for nuclear just during my basic, you know, because much of my time I spend advocating for nuclear plants. And Britain is a really important country because it, it could end up building six new reactors, French-made reactors. So I call, I just got in touch with her and I was like, you know, would you be willing to help me on this? And she said, yeah, right away. And then, um, and, and I, and I basically, we just hit it off. I really liked her and, and she liked us. And, and so we ended up making her our Britain, our British, uh, the, the director of the UK program for environmental progress. It's a crazy world. <laughs> she yeah. just sent me, she sent me a photo. She, so she, of course, I mailed her a signed copy, a dedication to her. Um, she just got it. She's been reading it for like the last like three or four days. Just send me a photo of it. It's quite, it's quite funny world, quite funny story. I think for her to, <laughs> for us to be allies, and that was only that was like three weeks ago that I hired yeah. her. Just, yeah. just happened. very cool. All right. Well, so lucky last question. Unless you want to. Um, no, I should, about... this be, no, no. I probably can just do one more too. I've got to get back to yeah. some stuff. No, very good. So we, we spoke about what people who are listening can do and, and the empowerment and so on, but like rub a magic lamp and tell me what you would like to achieve because you're heading in a different direction. You're heading in like a policy and, and, and that sort of like policy change on a national and international basis direction. So rub a magic lamp and what would you like to see happen in the next couple of decades? Yeah, I mean, I I think that the, I mentioned very briefly at the end of the book. I think some of the apocalyptic stuff comes from the fact that the I think the international system, so to speak, of nations is changing. I think nations are definitely reverting back to nationalism. Obviously, with Brexit, the election of Trump, with populist nationalists around the world, and I think that is a very it's a very scary time. It's a very dangerous time in a lot of ways. I think, but I think it's also a time of of real possibility. Um, and so I do see left and right breaking down and including, I think this book, I, I consider myself self still to be left of center, probably not, definitely not as left wing as I was as a boy, but I would guess I would probably call myself a moderate Democrat. And I, and the book is being enjoyed by people on the right and also by people like me. And it's not, Obvious, if you read this book, that anything in it is particularly conservative. Um, you know, it's an embrace of modernization and progress. Um, and to some extent, those are all liberal values. But what's what's exciting for me is precisely that I think there's there's the older political fault lines are breaking down, and there's going to be some room for us to advocate so that things like nuclear power, which have traditionally, or at least since the '60s, been viewed as a right wing technology. I don't think are I don't think are being viewed that way anymore. I think there's other things I care about that's not in the book, but things like building enough housing in these expensive coastal cities that the young people and the and the technology industries that they want to live in, and then I think having some kind of a new industrial policy, because our working class folks in the United States um, they feel really left behind, and and I think to some extent they have been. And so for me, what's exciting over the next 20 years is you know I think neoliberalism. The neoliberal era is is really over, and there's a chance to try to shape something better. And I think on the questions of energy and the environment, that creates really, I think, exciting possibilities for what we're calling a green nuclear deal, as well as for reorienting the World Bank, especially if 
you know, we're, if, if China is basically going to continue to be offering to help countries develop and America is going to be the, you know, the, the sticks in the mud and Europeans are going to basically refuse to fund development, I think there's a chance to really reorient world bank funding. So, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, I dedicated my life to just this idea that everybody should be able to live a prosperous life and that the human, uh, the negative environmental footprint of humankind should shrink. And I'm feeling more optimistic than ever in a lot of ways that that's something that we can achieve. Well, that's a magnificent place to, um, to end on, Michael. So for people who want to know more, tell them where they can get the book and where they can find out more about your good self. Thanks, Gordon. Yeah, I mean, they can usually people should get on Amazon. Um, Australia, they moved up the publication date because there has been such a such a fight <laughs> over this issue. I've been on Australian TV a couple times, and um, it's a hot topic in Australia. I, I, so still have, if it's Australia. I still have my Amazon UK Kindle account. That's how I got <laughs> that's how I got mine before anyone else in the country. I've been back a couple of years, but I still haven't changed it over. So, uh, and it's nice. reading like this, frankly. All right, so that's the book. What about, you know, elsewhere online and so on? Yeah, I mean, um, people can find, you know, my colleagues, my young, brilliant, young millennial colleagues and Zoomers uh, turned the entire book of Apocalypse Never into a set of charts and graphs. And we put, and there's like 150 of them, and they're so cool. They're so clear. My interv- I interviewed my daughters, for t- I interviewed her friends, you know, she's 14, and I interviewed her friends and what they wanted, and they all said, they just didn't feel like they had any accurate information about these issues, and so these charts and graphs for people that want to get more information, they can go to environmentalprogress.org, and, and if they want to be, if folks want to be involved in our, what we call our, our environmental humanistic movement or humanistic environmental movement, um, there's a lot of other opportunities on the website. Wonderful. Well, once again, congratulations on the book. Um, I, I think it's it's very timely, and it and it feels like uh, it feels like it's going to move the world in that direction you just described. So, yeah, thanks very much for your time. Thanks so much for having me. Unless someone is holding out on me, Langston probably. I think that's the first guest we've had on the show that has testified before Congress. So, you know, that's another check on the podcast bingo board I didn't know I had. Anyway, big appreciation for Michael for taking the time to talk to little old me. You will have noticed that the main priority I had going into this discussion was to surface the good news. I mean, like all serious intellectuals, I have catchphrases. And one of the ones that has already made it onto t-shirts is is optimism is a spell. So I wanted to center the scientific evidence that not only are you unlikely to go extinct in the next decade, the same appears true for the vast majority of fellow persons on this planet, as of today anyway, right? There's good news and there's news. The net effect of centering the causes for optimism when you only have an hour is that we we had to sideline all manner of fascinating data around agriculture, NGO investment, and yes, nuclear as a zero emission option. So I've included links to all the slides Michael mentioned at the end there, as well as a link to an open letter he published at the end of June in the lead up to the book launch, apologizing for alarmism on behalf of the environmental movement, which of course led to a flurry of cancellations and uncancellations. I encourage you to check them out and obviously to investigate the book Apocalypse Never for yourselves as well. But if my reason for centering optimism wasn't polemical, it was at least strategic. (laughs) Uh, I mentioned previous guest Charles Eisenstein during the show, and I just want to give you a couple of quotations from towards the beginning of his book, Climate, A New Story, that really, I think, resonate with my motives. So imagine me putting on those librarian half glasses as we begin. I bring up the waning power of scare tactics because the effort to halt ecological collapse uses many of the very same scare tactics. The primary climate change narrative is basically, trust us, bad things will happen if we don't hurry up and make big changes. It's almost too late. The enemy is at the gates. I want to question the assumption that we can and should motivate the public with fear-based appeals to self-interest. What about the opposite? What about appeals to love? 
is life on earth valuable or sacred in its own right or only in its utility to ourselves climate change activism abounds in war narratives war metaphors and war strategies the reason apart from the deep-seated habits of the story of separation is the desire to inspire the fervor and commitment that people display in wartime following the rhetorical template of war we invoke an existential threat i don't think it is working i hesitate to use the term climate change in my essay titles the last time i did so one reader wrote to me saying i almost didn't read your post because it had the words climate change in the title and i'm just so sick of hearing the same thing over and over again maybe we are becoming war weary does it take more and more exhortation to goad you into joining another battle have you encountered burnout when no new horror can stimulate you to the kind of engagement you practiced a few years ago burnout seems the downfall of activists but as the story of the man lost in a maze implies it can be a necessary initiation into a wholly different mode of engagement. My friend, Pat McCabe, a Dine woman and longtime student of the Lakota Way, puts it this way. When you reach the end of your resources, then the magic happens. When we exhaust what we know, then what we don't know becomes possible. So that's the first quote, and I'm just moving forward in the book. The failures of carbon-motivated policies have something in common. They emphasize the global over the local, the distant over the immediate, and the measurable over the qualitative. This oversight is part of a more general mentality that sacrifices what is precious, sacred, and immediate for a distant end. It is the mentality of instrumentalism that values other beings and the earth itself in terms of their utility for us. It is the hubris of believing we can predict and control the consequences of our actions. It is the trust in mathematical modeling that allows us to make decisions according to the numbers. It is the belief that we can identify a cause, a cause that is something and not everything, and that we can be we can best understand reality by dissecting it and isolating variables. Usually, making decisions by the numbers means making them according to financial considerations. Is it really a very deep change to take the same method and mentality and apply them instead to some other number? We are in familiar territory in addressing problems by attacking their isolable direct causes. That again is the mentality of war. End crime by deterring perpetrators. End evil by dominating the evildoers. End drug abuse by banning drugs. Stop terrorism by killing the terrorists. But the world is more complicated than that. As the war on crime, the war on drugs, the war on weeds, the war on terrorism, and the war on germs shows us, causation is usually not linear. Crime, drugs, weeds, terrorism, and germs might be symptoms of a deeper, systemic disharmony. Poor soil invites weeds. A rundown body offers a salubrious environment for germs. Poverty breeds crime. Imperialism begets violent resistance. Alienation, hopelessness, loss of meaning, and disintegration of community foster drug addiction. To address the complex of deep causes is a lot more difficult than to find something to blame and attack it using the familiar reductionistic methods. That's the end of Charles. So, and that's the end of the show. <laughs> it um, This one timed conveniently for the premium members who are either diving into or re-diving into the Magical Geography course in advance of the custodian course that begins in earnest next month. As we look out at, I guess, the next 12 months at least and think of how we are to best be with this moment, uh, best stay with the trouble, if you will. It seemed expedient <laughs> to cancel a few apocalypses. We not only have an abundance of them to choose from currently, but the invitation to multi-species flourishing is, as far as I can tell anyway, the best way to tackle several at once. Until next time. Until next time.